Ephesians chapter 2. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away our sin. So it's Easter, and uh, kids are having egg hunts and all that kind of stuff. Got a little Easter joke for you. Ready? Yeah, camera's back there going. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're ready or not. Why did the Easter egg hide? Because he was a little chicken. Oh, yeah. I saw that this morning with the kids. I just had to, I had to share it with you. But, you know, you know, when it comes to Easter and we think about all these, you know, we get dressed up a little bit. We have Easter egg hunts. Peeps come out everywhere, you know, and whether you're a peep fan or not. I don't know. Peep fan? Okay. A few of you. Yeah, most of you are like most of my family. Non-peep fan, right? I, most of you are probably non-peep fan. Yeah, you know, all those things come out, but the... The celebration of today has nothing to do with clothes and bunnies and all that. We know today is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. And that's why we're here today. You know, we have fun with all the little things with our families, but with our family, with our church family, and what we proclaim to the world is that today is not about bunnies, it's not about eggs, it's not about peeps, it's not about jelly beans. It's about Jesus, right? And he is alive and he is risen. And that's why we celebrate today. And I saw last night uh, a guy that I follow on Twitter. He, he tweeted out, pray for the persecuted church. And this might bring some perspective to this day because today we celebrate life. We celebrate that we can have life through Christ and in Christ from ourselves being dead spiritually. And we need to remember today that as we live in a country of freedom where we gather with no real fear of Anybody telling us that we can't do what we're doing, there are, there's the, 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 the church worldwide are meeting today, and as Cameron said, maybe even yesterday because of the time differences, in places where they celebrate the life of Christ, but yet they are under the threat of death for doing so. And so as we meet to celebrate the life of Jesus, and as we join with our believers, our, our brothers and sisters worldwide, we're doing the same thing, yet they're doing so under the threat of even death and persecution. Let us remember the weight of what we're celebrating. That were that the case for us, we would still have a reason to come and celebrate and worship Jesus because he is worthy. And he's given us life. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Ephesians chapter 2 is hard, you know, sometimes because every message, it seems like this is one of the coolest passages in Scripture. And it is. All of Scripture is great. But man, what truth is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 today? So if you're there, just follow along. It'll be on the screen if you're not. Celebration of the life that Christ gives us. Now, before I read it, I want to tell you this. God, uh, I've got his commentary here. It's a guy named Tony Mer Merida. He um, specifically in describing verses 4 through 10 that I'm about to read to you, but I'll kind of extend it out to 1 through 10. If, you, if you're a believer in Jesus, this is your biography. If God were to write a story of your life you may include a lot of things, but this would be the foundation of your biography if you're a believer in Christ. Listen as we read. This is you. This is me. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Believer, that's your biography. There may be a lot of different things you could say about your life, but this, if you're a believer, is the most important thing about your life. And I want to just share with you, I want to take this scripture and do as others have done, and just kind of break this up into two sections. Very simple. The first section is, and you. The first verse starts, and you. I want to describe you and me without Christ. But then we want to look at verses 4 through 10. Second section, but God. I want to see what God did because of what we needed. And you. Let's look what he says. First of all, he describes us, Paul describes us as being spiritually dead. He, said, he says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. What does it mean that we were dead? Because if you're hearing this, if you're hearing me talk to you, there is an element of life to you, right? Blood is running through your veins. Your heart is pumping. Your lungs are breathing. There is a sense of life in you. What does it mean that without Christ, we're dead? We're spiritually dead. Well, certainly it means that if we continue in that, we will be dead for eternity. Eternal death. Eternal punishment. Hell. Scripture defines it. Of course it means that. But what, what does it mean? It means that if you are not in Christ, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, you are cut off. You are alienated. You are separated from true life. What is very deceptive about living life is that an unbeliever can walk around and live life and feel like they're experiencing true life and the fullness of life and their life may seem full as they define it. Their, their bodies are breathing, their bodies are healthy, everything's going well. Life is just seeming to give them roses and bubble gum and cotton candy and everything's great and I'm living life. But from God's perspective, what true life is, true life that extends through eternity, is connection with Him, communion with Him. The scripture says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. In Him there is life. That's true life. And so there is a semblance of temporary life, our bodies, us living. There is a reality. That true life comes from communion with God. And those who do not know Jesus are not communing with God, identified with Him, trusted Him as their Lord and Savior, are spiritually dead. Very alive physically, but very dead spiritually in the only way that matters. What does it mean we're dead spiritually? We're unable to respond to God. Dead people can't talk. Dead people can't walk. Dead people can't do Spiritually dead people can't respond to God. There's death. There's a very real sense of inability for spiritually dead people to do anything about their deadness. And here we begin to see the hopelessness of this spiritual death that all of us are in before Christ. The prodigal son, you remember that story? I won't go through it all, but... When he finally comes home and his father embraces him and welcomes him back. This story, a great picture of the way God the Father receives us when we come to him. He said, this is my son who was dead and now is alive. The picture, this story is a picture of what what what. What God the Father, how He celebrates over sinners when they come in repentance back to Him. And he, in this story, the Father in the story describes the Son who was 
running from God and lost as being dead. We are dead in our rebellion against God. But we are given life when we come to him. So spiritually dead. I want to re read you a few quotes. This one by Wood. The most, the most vital part of man's personality, the spirit, is dead to the most important factor in life, God. Legan Duncan, a pastor in Mississippi, says this. Every part of every human being apart from the saving and restraining grace of God is morally corrupt. It means that because of our deadness, because of our sin, we'll get that in a second, our whole nature, everything about us has been corrupted with sin. And Ligon Duncan says it's not like unbelievers and people apart from Christ are in God's doghouse, right? Husbands, you know what that's all about, right? You got to work to get out of that doghouse. It's not like unbelievers are in God's doghouse, as if they can work their way out of it. It's as if we are in the morgue, dead, needing rescue that we can't work our way out of. We're spiritually dead, and we're spiritually dead because of our sin and trespasses. Our trespasses and sins. He, he uses the word trespasses. This, this brings the idea of trespassing, crossing a line, crossing a boundary. And so God has a way that he wants us to live. It's outlined in scripture. It's, it's his righteousness. It's his holiness. It's his standard. And we are constantly crossing those lines. We're trespassing his law. We're trespassing his standard. We're going outside of the bounds of how he would have us to live. He's holy and he, does, he made us for his glory and, 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 and we trespass what it means to live for his glory. Then he uses the word sins. Sins, uh, this idea it brings across the idea of, of missing the mark. Like God has a, a mark that he wants us to hit if you want to think of a bullseye on a, on a target. But we're constantly missing it. Falling short. You can, you can kind of look at this one as... You know, there's a mark that we need to hit, but we're falling short of that line. So whether you're crossing a line or you're falling short of a line, you get the idea. There's a way that God would have us to live for his glory, yet we don't do it. We don't do it because we are spiritually dead and we are cut off from life. And because we are cut off from life because of our sin, we can't live that life. We just have to live according to our nature, which is sin and spiritually dead. So we can't act in our spiritual deadness, cut off from true life and righteousness. We can't act to overcome our nature because we're cut off. Are you starting to feel the hopelessness of our condition without Christ? If you come from a perspective of, I'm just going to work my way to God, some of this is making, making no sense to you because you're like, no, I just do, do, do until God approves of me. What scripture defines us as is as this. You can't do, do, do for God to approve of you. You're dead spirit. You're unable. You're in the morgue. And it's because of your sin and your trespass that you are there. We're not good. There's no amount of goodness in us. As a matter of fact, when, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, to the people who are following him, right? He's not talking to the Pharisees. He's not talking to these people, these sinners, you know, all these kind of folks that we know are, are sinners and rebelling against God. He's talking to his disciples who are following him. He's talking about prayer. And, and, and he's talking about how the, the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And, and he says, if you, and listen to these next words, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the, whole, will the, will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He's telling his disciples that they're evil. They're not good. We aren't good. You aren't good. You may do good things, but without Christ, you're spiritually dead, and you can't act outside of that nature. You're not good. And there's no amount of goodness that you can muster to overcome your nature. So be very careful, believer and unbeliever, with comparing your life to those that are air quotes, worse than you. 
because you give yourself a false sense of goodness that is not true about yourself. We are spiritually dead because of our sins and trespasses, and we are rebellious and enslaved. Look at verse 2. Verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and the sins. Verse 2, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince, the power, the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The scripture defines us apart from Christ, no matter how good you think you are or how good someone seems to be, as following the course of the world, which is opposed to God, as following Satan, the prince of the power of the air, is really describing Satan. There's a lot going on in those words. We don't have time to talk about it. But that's basically following Satan. And you're following your sinful, spiritually dead flesh. All your passions, all your desires, your, your body carries out the sins that come from this desire. Your mind conceives of ways to sin. And even in doing good, we are incredibly sinful in doing it. And sometimes we do good for the purposes of evil, which is a real deception for us who think we're good. We carry out the desires of our flesh and our mind out of our sinful nature because we're conforming our thoughts and our actions and our thinking and our attitudes to that of the world, to that of Satan. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 8, it says if you're not a believer, your father is the devil. It says right here that we all were sons of disobedience. Right after he says we're following Satan. Our biggest influence is not Jesus, it's not God, it's Satan, it's the world, it's our flesh. You're in a terrible, terrible state. You can't live the life of Christ. You just have to live according to your flesh. Charles Spurgeon, my goodness, he says it like this, listen. What a dreadful thing it is. A man dead to all that is good, but alive through the indwelling of the devil that is within him. Our actions as unbelievers show our spiritual deadness. Be very careful. Be very careful that you don't think just because I desire it means that it is good or right. Because if you desire it and it's not, it's not led by the Spirit and it's not led by the Word of God, you very possibly, more than likely, are being led by the desires of your flesh, by the desires of the world, by the desires of the enemy, by the desires of, of that which is against God. Just because you desire it and want it doesn't mean that it's good or right. We live in a world right now that says, if you want it, it must be good. It must be right. If you think it, it must be good or right. But we know that's not true. All that comes from being influenced by the flesh. This is all bad news telling you bad news for a reason. Because once you know the bad news, the good news is that much more glorious. This sinful state we're in, it feels like freedom. It feels like I don't have to live like the church tells me to live. I can live how I want. I'm free. But let me tell you something. And I stand on scripture here, not on Ken's word. In Romans chapter 6, apart from Christ, we are slaves to sin. So if you feel like living how I want, I don't have to live how God tells me to live or the church tells me to live or how I'm taught to live. I'm going to kind of do my thing and live my... You're not free. You're just living according to your master, which is sin. You have to sin. You're enslaved. And we have that twisted. We think we're free to do what we want. But apart from Christ, we can't do what he wants. We have to do what sin, who is our master, tells us. So it, 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 it's just a very bleak picture here of our terribly sinful condition that David in Psalm chapter 51, verse 5 says, We were even sinful from conception. Sin, spiritual deadness, all that is so intrinsic in who we are, we were sinful even at the moment of our conception. We are in a terrible state of helplessness and hopelessness. He keeps on going. He says, he says we were all children of wrath like the rest of 
mankind. I want to stop here and just say something for a moment because this is a little pet peeve. You hear people say, you know, we're all children of God, right? No, we're not all children of God. All humans are not children of God. I understand the sentiment behind that. God made us all. I get that. It's true that God didn't make us all. But be careful. We're not all children of God because what happens when you say that, you blur the lines for people who don't follow Jesus and you give them an idea that they are one of his sons or daughters. And we are only son, a son or a daughter of God if we are in Christ. We're not all children of God according to this passage. We're children of wrath. We're sons and daughters of disobedience. So don't dangerously blur those lines. We're children of wrath by our nature, Paul said. And, and God's wrath is going to come. This children of wrath idea, this wrath that it's talking about, it's God's wrath against sin, his judgment against sin. Because you are all these things that we're describing this morning, God justly will condemn those who aren't in Christ but are spiritually dead. Because if trespass is law, they, are, they, they, they fall way short of his glory for the reason that they were made. Their sins are forgiven and wrath is pointed to everyone who is in that state. And what we what we need to understand is this is fair because you have disobeyed your creator. You've fallen way short of what your creator made you for. And for him to punish unrighteousness, it upholds his holiness and it's fair. It's not like one day God's going to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did this. You know, he's not going to be out of control, lose his temper. It's just going to be like a judge saying, this is what you earned and this is what Tony Merida in this, this, in this exposition commentary, he says this. He says, God is holy and he will not sweep sin under the rug. Many think God in the Old Testament was a God of wrath. But God in the New Testament is like Mr. Rogers. Wrong. What we have now is a period of patience. The door of mercy is open wide now, and we can come into this grace and be saved. But the coming wrath of God is worse than anything in the Old Testament. And so let me just be very clear. This is not a popular thing to say in a lot of churches nowadays. But if you are a, not a believer and you're not following Jesus, you will experience the condemnation and wrath and an eternal hell from God if you don't turn to him. It's the truth. It's not popular to say that now. Everybody wants to think of, of all the good things God gives, and he does. Just wait. It's coming in just about two minutes. But the reality is before we can know the grace that we need and how amazing that grace is, we have to know the depth of our condition the reality of our situation, the going into that doctor's office and letting him tell you, you are sick and you are dying and this is what you need. You can run around away from that doctor's office and just ignore your condition all you want. And you can die in your condition. Or you can go to the great physician and you can say, hey, show me, expose me, tell me where I'm sick. You're spiritually dead in your trespass and the sin, and you're a child of my wrath. You need to be delivered from your sin. Oh, how does that get fixed? Verse 4, section 2. But God. I want everybody to say it. But God. I'll say it again. But God. And you, all this that we've been talking, I got chills. All that we've been talking about is and you. That's you, but God. This is what God did because of your condition, in your condition. God acted in response to that because he is not just a God of wrath. He is, but he is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of great love. He's rich in mercy, Paul says here. But God, these two words, but God, are some of the greatest words in Scripture. 
Because you, you sit in the misery and the hopelessness and the pitiful condition of verses 1 through 3. You're like, I tried, these are terrible illustrations, but I'll try. You're like that dog who's waiting for his owner to come home all day and it's like, nobody to play with, play the ball with me, nobody to feed me. But then all of a sudden, that dog, if, if you could have a video camera on that dog and, and the keys go in the lock, right, you're home. That's that but God moment right here. Oh. Or you're like that, um, you're like that boy and that girl that are breaking up, right? They love each other, but they just don't think it's going to work. And they kind of talk, they kind of like, you know, it's just not going to work. And, they kinda, and then he goes to walk away. And she goes, wait a minute. And he's like. And they try to work it out and fix it. It's that, it's that feeling of, I don't know, I just try to imagine some things. Maybe, maybe you're in a, maybe you're a coal miner and you're working in a, in a mining shaft and all of a sudden, you know, everything just caves in and it feels hopeless and it's dark. But then all of a sudden, and you think you're going to die in there. And all of a sudden, you hear some chisel and you see a gleam of light. And you're like, there's hope. Or maybe if this is a better illustration than them all. It's that, that hospital where you hear that, that, that flatlining beep, beep from someone who's just died and they're trying their best to get this person alive and all of a sudden you hear beep, beep, beep and you're like, oh, life. Those are terrible illustrations. But they help give us the idea of what this but God means. We being spiritually dead, hopeless, pitiful, helpless, but God, rich in mercy, has great love for us, made us alive. Christian, this is your bi biography. He made you alive. Though you were spiritually dead, unable to respond to him, he came and made you alive. Though you were a rebellious one slave to sin, following the desires of the flesh, following the world, following God's enemy, Satan, following him, but God brought you back to himself. Though you were a child of wrath, headed for an eternal hell, but God stepped in and said, I want to give you eternal life. But God, how did he do this? Through our identification with Jesus. Let's look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so what happened? How did, Jesus, how did, how did God make us alive from such a hopeless condition that we are in? Well, when, when we come to that place in our life where we acknowledge that, that we are all these things, but that Christ paid the penalty and we believe in his gospel, what happens is God takes your life and he takes the life of Christ. He takes your life and he identifies it with Jesus. So what happened to Jesus happened to you. That's why it's a gift and not something that you earn. It's something that Jesus had to do for you and give to you. He made you alive. So you were associated. You were identified with Jesus in his death. We didn't love God, but he loved us. 1 John 4.10. And Christ was the propitiation. That's a big word meaning he took the wrath of God for us on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. If you were here yet last week when Pastor Cameron gave that, wow, what an awesome message. Last week. He was talking about the wrath of God, the cup, when Jesus was in that garden of Gethsemane, and he looked at the cup of wrath, you know, in front of him, and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What he was saying is, this cup of your wrath that, that I'm going to have to drink, the wrath of mankind's sin, if it's possible for another way for this to happen, for, 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 for your plan to get carried out, let it be. This wrath is just, oh, and he was... He, There was no other way. Jesus had to drink that cup. And listen, church, Jesus drank every drop of the wrath of God that was in that cup for you. There is no wrath, not 
one little drop left for you. Jesus drank it all. He took the wrath and the punishment of God's uh, 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 just wrath for our sin on himself. And now that cup is dry. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, your life is identified with Jesus in that way, in that when he died for sin, he died for your sin. R.C. Sproul says, The glory of the gospel is this. The one from whom we need to be saved is the one who has saved us. Look at the wonder of what God did for you. Okay, so like, when I first moved into my house, I had some elderly next-door neighbors. They were 90-something years old, both of them. I didn't have a lawnmower at the time, but I needed to cut my grass, so I asked if I could borrow their lawnmower. And just getting used to the, to the yard, I knew it was there, but I wasn't really careful. There was this... It was this, uh, this water drain, water meter cover thing. And I was trying to get around there, you know, and kind of being bullheaded and not be real careful, just trying to get as close as I can. You know, didn't have a weed eater either, so I'm trying. And, and, I, and I kind of lift up the, the lawnmower, and I hit the thing. And it breaks the whatever underneath it. Oil's leaking out. I'm going to have to go to my new neighbors and be like, I offered to pay for it, and if I remember correctly, he really didn't want to do that, but I kind of insisted and paid for it. It's like the one who committed the offense deserves, or, or he should be the one to pay the one who was offended to make things right. But watch this. God, in that little lawnmower illustration, that God was the one that was offended. God was the one that needed restitution paid to him. God was the one who was injured. Yet he's the one who took the payment for what we did to injure him or to offend him. Do you get the point? He said, no, I got it. I'll take care of it. You offended me, but I'll pay for it grace of God. Imagine that on a, on a, on a, on a God wrath sin sized level. So much bigger than a simple lawnmower illustration. That's what God did for you. He paid for your sin. He also identified you in the resurrection of Christ. We celebrate in the resurrection today. Jesus died for your sin, but on the third day he also rose from the dead. He's alive today. The resurrection is crucial to our salvation. I wish all of you could have been at our sunrise service this morning when Daniel Magger gave us a message on the resurrection. It was beautiful. Because the implications of the resurrection for our lives and our salvation is huge. I'll have to run through it quickly. I see the time. But when your life is identified with Christ in his death, your life is also identified with Christ in his resurrection. I'll just have to reference some of these verses. It, what it means is when, when, when Christ rose from the dead and you're identified with him, you were raised to new life with him. You were no longer spiritually dead, but you were made alive. And what happened was you were justified before God. Made right before God. You had trespassed His law. You had fallen short of His glory. Yet now, because of what Jesus had done, and, God, and because God raised Him from the dead, Romans 4.25 says, that we were justified before God. Made right. The resurrection was God's stamp of approval that the payment of Christ was enough. When Jesus had paid for sin, God raised Him from the dead in victory as the king of our salvation. And through his work, we were made right with God. We were justified. His resurrection also promises our future resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this. There is a future resurrection awaiting for believers. Right? Daniel talked about it so well this morning that if we are, if we as Christians don't have a future resurrection to, to eternal life, then we are to be pitied among, more than anybody on the earth that we're living for something that is not true. As a matter of fact, if, we, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if Christ didn't rise from the dead and there is no resurrection, then we're still in our sins and we're in a pitiful shape. 
But because Christ rose from the dead, it promises for us a future resurrection that just as he raised and he has a new body, the first fruits of the resurrection, right? What happens to us when we die and our spirits go to be with him for a time, but then when Jesus comes back and he, 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 he raises our, our, our bodies and he gives us a new glorious body and those of us who are alive are changed and we receive a new body and there and there at that moment death is finally defeated sin is finally defeated the consequences of our sin is finally done death is done to reign no more where oh death is your victory where oh death uh, is your sting and so it promises for us a future resurrection. And that 1 Corinthians 15 passage talks about it a little bit more. It says, because there's a future resurrection, be steadfast and abounding in the work of the Lord. And so because we know that there's a future resurrection coming and we're, we're, there's an end that is good for us, it is worth following Jesus today. This path that, that includes us in Christ and includes eternal life and that future resurrection, right? It's worth following Jesus today and being on that Jesus road, as they say in Africa. And it's worth abounding in the work of the Lord so that others can experience this future resurrection in Christ. So we work to bring others to Jesus. Our work is not in vain. It gives us a motivation for obedience and evangelism. The resurrection of Jesus gives us victory over sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says that because Christ died and rose from the dead, we can walk in newness of life. Believe, uh, Christian, you have no excuse for your sin. The power of God lives in you, and he can help you overcome the sin in your life. Will you struggle? Yes, because you battle with the flesh. But he can help you overcome. There is victory over sin. And I will read this. Romans chapter 5. Because of the resurrection of Christ, life, not death, reigns in your life. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, that's Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so you see what's happening here. Us spiritually dead, unable, hopeless, helpless without Christ. Because of being identified with Him through faith. We'll get to that in just a second. Death no longer reigns over us. We are made alive and, and life reigns over our life. You are made alive in Christ through what He did in your life and nothing you did for yourself. Just like Lazarus when he came out of that tomb. Jesus said, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, I think he was dead three or four days. He raised Lazarus. Lazarus came out with all the grave clothes on him. And Jesus said, untie him and let him go. Get all that stuff off him. Everything associated with death, get it off of him. Because he's not dead anymore. He's alive. And when you, and when you were identified with Jesus in his death and then his resurrection, everything about death fell off of you. The, the consequences of your sin that would end in eternal death is gone. The, the, the dominion of sin over your life is gone. Life reigns. Not death anymore. Not sin. William McDonald says, we, we stand on the resurrection side of the tomb. And then he says, Paul says, he has seated us with him in heaven. Believer, right now, Philippians 3.20 says this, that our citizenship is in heaven. And so Spurgeon says it's something like this. He said, it's one thing, for this isn't a perfect quote, this is my paraphrase of what he said. He said, it's one thing for us to look from, from earth to heaven. That's good. I mean, we need to fix our thoughts on heavenly things. It's one thing for us to look from earth to heaven, but it is still another for us to look from heaven to earth. Because right now, believer, there's a sense of the already not yet thing going on. You are seated with Christ. It's, it, it will happen. You will realize that it will happen in its fullness one day, but it is such a certain thing that it is, it, 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 Paul speaks of, of it as a certainty, as if it's already happened. And so you are seated with Christ. And so what we need to do as citizens of heaven, we don't look just from heaven to earth. 
we look from a position of being seated with Christ forever to the things of the world. And Spurgeon says, and we see everything down here as beneath us. Doesn't mean we see other people as beneath us, but we see everything that happens down here as, as nothing superior to being seated up here. Any trials and tribulations that happen down here don't define what's going on up there. Any, any things that, 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 that take our eyes off of Jesus, we see ourselves as above all the things of the earth. We are seated with Christ. Because He ascended, we ascended with Him in our identification with Him. So we need to start to live that way. So here's the big implication for today. Being made alive in Christ through His gospel. Listen. Big implication. I know I've been preaching a while. Here we go. This identification is the greatest identification that you can have on this earth. Being made alive in Jesus is more valuable than any other identification you have in this world. The biggest definition of your life is not how much money you make, how great you are at athletics, how educated you are, how big of a house you have. The greatest identification in life is being made alive in Christ. Conversely, you don't have to be defined by the worst part of your nature anymore. Some of us have botched it Big time in our lives. We have messed up. We have things in our past that haunt us. And some of us are struggling with shame because of that. And we should hate our sin. And we should try to flee our sin. But when we come to Jesus, He forgives our shameful past. He forgives our sin. And you don't have to walk around in despair and shame and being identified by your sin anymore. You're identified with Christ. Your identity is in Him. And all of a sudden, being made alive in Jesus and identified with Christ and His resurrection and His new life supersedes any identity that you have on this earth. And believer, it's what we need to start living like. Some of us are living according to the identities of the world. We're letting the identity of the world drive our lives. We value more our position in life and our persona with others than we do being made alive in Christ. And that drives our actions and our lives and our motivations and our attitudes. That, that drives us. And we need to say, yeah, all that's good, and God can use all that, but that's not the greatest thing in my life. What defines me is being made alive in Christ. And let that identify, drive your, your life and your actions and your motives and your attitudes. We need a shift in what is our greatest identity. And some of us who are walking around in shame because of our sin, and maybe even some of us are not coming to Christ because of the shame of our sin that He could never love me. I want to tell you something. There is no sin too great that God didn't die for it. And He wants to make you alive in Him. And He wants to release you from the guilt and shame of anything you've ever committed. You go read about the woman caught in adultery and see how much God doesn't want to condemn you. He wants you to go and sin no more, but He didn't want to condemn you. He died so He didn't have to condemn you. So what do we do? I've got to move. So I've got to read this really, I've got to, I've got to do this really quickly. It, Paul says it's by grace that we've been saved. What does that simply mean? He goes all throughout this, it's in a lot of these verses, grace, 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 mercy. It's not because of anything in you that God saved you. It was by His grace. You didn't do anything to earn it. You didn't do anything to make yourself lovable to God. You didn't do cooler things than the person sitting beside you. And so God said, okay, cool. You'd be a good dude in my kingdom because of what you got. No, he looked at you as spiritually dead and helpless and hopeless and wanted to set his affection on you and breathe life, spiritual life into you by his grace. His grace and his love, his mercy was the only motivator. Nothing in you. We can't pat ourselves on the back, boast in our salvation. He gave it to you. 
when it says that, that we are saved by grace through faith, all of that, by grace, through our faith, which is our response, all that is grace given from Him. So even in some weird way that none of us can figure it out, the faith that you put in Christ was still a gift from Him. He did it all. Salvation is His work. How does that work that God saved me, but yet I had to choose Him and put faith in Him? I don't know how all that meets together. I know that salvation is all His work, but I know that we have to put our faith in Him. So that's what we preach. The only way you can be saved is no work that you can do. It's through faith. My little Joseph, he's one year old now. And he's a squirrely little guy. And I'll hold him sometimes. He's a cute little thing. And he'll be, I'll be holding him in my hand. And he's completely dependent on me holding him. So much so... That when he gets really squirrely, he, he changes just like that sometimes. Is that really what happens with kids? Anyway, so if he gets mad, here's what he'll do while I'm holding him. He'll, ask Sammy if it's not true. He did it to her this morning. He, he, he'll he take and he'll go, Pfft. and I'm like, dude, do you know what you're doing? I could have dropped you right then. I mean, he has such faith and trust in me, his father, that he is putting the full weight of his trust and his hope to not, I won't say not die, but you understand what I'm saying, in me holding him. Faith is saying, I can't, I don't put any weight in anything I can do. I put my, the full weight of my hope and my trust in what Jesus did, and I'm looking to him for my salvation, and I'm giving him the full weight of my life for him to live his life through me. And I trust in him alone for my salvation. That's what we do to be saved. It's not some magic prayer. It's not some equation. It's not some work you got to do to work your way up there. You don't have to go through this class to kind of figure out how to be saved. It's putting, it's understanding the gospel of Jesus, realizing that it's a gift from God and that we can't save ourselves, that He did it all, and putting our faith and trust in Him. That's what it means to be saved. And that's what Christ is offering you today. It goes on to say we're His workmanship. He does the work in us. We're created for good works. We aren't saved by good works. We're created in Christ for good works. But I'm going to close with this story. There, there's a story, I think it was, uh, I won't read it. It was George Whitfield, I believe. Great evangelist. I think the story goes, he preached John chapter 3. That's John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that verse. He preached on John 3. Thousands of times, and he was at a he was at a, a meeting, a revival meeting, I guess, and he was preaching. And this guy came up to him after he preached. This guy had a pocket full of rocks. And what we find out is this guy came to this meeting to take these rocks and throw them at George Whitfield's head. And here was the guy's quote. I came to break your head, but your sermon broke my heart. And this guy came to know Christ as his Savior. Through the gospel, God made him alive in Christ through his understanding of the gospel. I want you to know, no matter who you are, there's two applications, big applications today. No matter who you are, God wants to make you alive in Him. No matter what you've done, no matter what your attitude was when you came in here, He wants the gospel message to settle in your life and bring you salvation. Trust Him by faith. But believers who are in here, the people outside of these walls that we think are just rock throwers at evangelists, are people that God wants to make alive in Christ and we need to live and love and share as such. Being made alive in Christ is the greatest identity that you can have. Let's start to live like that. And so when we pray, I'm going to be down front. I'll be glad to receive you if you want to talk about that. We're not, we won't settle everything right here. 
we can plan to talk at a, at a later time. We can pray together. We can plan to talk at a later time about questions you have or a decision you want to make for Christ, and we'll be glad to receive you if you want to come to Christ. If you want to pray or you've got something going on in your life, feel free to respond as, as our musicians play. Let's pray. God, what a glorious message of life and hope that the gospel is. Thank you for it. And Lord Jesus, I just pray simply by your grace that decisions that need to be made by those in this room would be made. That faith would be put in Christ. That salvation would come. The believers who are living for other identities would live for the one identity that matters. And that life would reign. And so Holy Spirit, do your work from this moment forward. As we leave, leave and as we live. God, do your work in your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing, and if you'd like to respond to Christ today, I'll be down for it. sunrise. God, uh, God bless you. And as we leave today, let the message of Easter not stay. It's a message for the world. And so as the church, let's go and share. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.